So what I want to look at today is Ramses II's long and sometimes checkered history with another great empire of the ancient world, uh, the Hittite Empire. Now, of course, Ramses is well known as a warrior pharaoh, in particular, his famous Battle of Kadesh, which was fought against the Hittite Empire. But he was also a great peacemaker. And in fact, if you go to the United Nations building in New York, in the entrance hall, there is a large bronze replica donated by the modern state of Turkey, which contains a cuneiform text recording a peace treaty between Ramses II and the Hittite king Hattusili III, which is often credited as being the first major peace treaty between two independent states in the history of humanity. While this is not quite the first peace treaty in history, it is certainly one of the earliest and among the earliest between two great kingdoms. And of course, its presence in the United Nations is meant to evoke the idea of peace and harmony between nations. But behind this hopeful sentiment of happiness and peace between these two ancient kingdoms, in fact, there was a certain amount of bad blood. For up to 60 years, the Hittite Empire, which is often not as familiar to us as ancient Egypt, the Hittite Empire, which occupied much of what is now Turkey, and which extended its authority into the northern part of modern Syria, found itself at odds with the Egyptian Empire of the New Kingdom, which in the late 18th dynasty extended as far north as the Syrian areas of the ancient kingdom of Amuru and the famous city-state of Kadesh in the Homs region of modern Syria. And during the Amarna period, this region of Amaru and the uh, citadel of Kadesh became the chief bone of contention between the Egyptian empire in the south and the expansive Hittite empire in the north as they came to blows over this territory in a multi-generational conflict, which would last for about 60 years from the reign of the Pharaoh Akhenaten late in the 18th dynasty until the 21st year of the Pharaoh Ramses II, when he finally buried the hatchet with the Hittites and signed his famous peace treaty. My new book on Ramses II, one of the major themes of the book is exploring relations between these two ancient superpowers, looking a bit at the prehistory of the Egyptian Hittite conflict before Ramses' time, and also exploring Ramses' long and colorful relations with the Hittites first on the battlefield as he fought the famous Battle of Kadesh, as you see here illustrated in this wonderful battle scene in the chapter five about the Battle of Kadesh, his less well-known later wars after the Battle of Kadesh, and then the road to peace as he negotiated a peace treaty with the Hittites. And finally, after the peace was signed, as he said about having peaceful relations and intense diplomatic contacts with the Hittite kingdom over the next several decades. So if we begin with the early part of Ramses II's reign, following on a series of wars that his predecessors had fought against the Hittites, including his father, Seti I, one of the chief objectives that the Egyptians had was to recapture the territory of Kadesh, which Egypt had lost to the Hittite empire during the Amarna period. Ramses' own father, Seti I, another great warrior king, had actually managed to capture Kadesh. Unfortunately, he was not able to hold on to it. And shortly after Seti's troops went home, the city soon reverted to the control of the Hittite Empire. Now, of course, Kadesh and Syria were very close to the Hittite homeland, whereas Syria was actually hundreds of miles away from the main Egyptian homeland frontier. It was much more difficult for the Egyptians to extend their, their military reach all the way north 
away from their borders, and therefore it was a difficult challenge for them to hold on to Syria, or in fact to reconquer it in the face of implacable Hittite resistance to Egypt's attempt to regain its lost border province of Kadesh. Here you have a wonderful scene that is found in the temple of Ramses II at Abu Simbel, in, carved inside the mountainside in Nubia. Today, if you go there, you will see these scenes, but the original beautiful paint which covered the walls has sadly decayed. But here we have an early 19th century copy which shows us just how spectacular these battle scenes were in their original condition when they were picked out with beautiful paint. Now, another element of the Battle of Kadesh narrative we see here is the king's allegedly single-handed counterattack as, an, as it were an army of one. As we are told, the pharaoh single-handedly conquers and defeats the Hittites after the uh, Hittite enemy supposedly ambushes the Egyptian troops and after allegedly his own troops abandon him and do not offer effective resistance to the Hittites, Ramses rallies and single-handedly, we are told, routes the Hittite attack and drives them into the uh, Orontes River on the outskirts of Kadesh. Now, obviously, this is a very tall tale and almost nobody today would take this seriously. In fact, we have to understand, however, that Ramses is not to be simply labeled a liar for telling us an untruth. Another major theme of my book is to explore the role that ideology plays in ancient in Egyptian inscriptions, because the ideology, which is the, essentially the worldview of the ancient Egyptian civilization, where the pharaoh was seen as the center of the universe, as the champion of order against the forces of chaos. And of course, chaos is represented by foreign enemies. By necessity, the pharaoh is believed to be this force of order that puts chaos to flight and suppresses this chaos. And he supposedly does this single-handedly. Now, Ramsey's depiction of the Battle of Kadesh is quite literally the most over-the-top example of this kind of ideology we have in Egyptian records. But in its essential quality, it is no different than other Egyptian kings who also claim that they single-handedly defeated the enemy. And so if we call Ramses a fibber for selling us this unbelievable tale, we have to understand that other pharaohs and in fact other ancient kings from civilizations, including the Hittites or the Babylonians or the Assyrians, did quite very much the same thing. It's just that nobody did it quite like Ramses when it came to telling this kind of tale. Now, often the Battle of Kadesh is seen as a defeat for the Egyptians. And it is true that Ramses failed in his primary objective. He was unable to conquer the city of Kadesh. The question of how badly either he or the Hittite army was defeated in the actual battle is very much up for debate. Some would argue that he got a bad mauling and was sent back to Egypt with his tail between his legs rather bruised and bloody, and at least the Egyptian army. Others would say that he won a kind of tactical victory, that he successfully repelled the, the Hittite ambush, but even if he was unable to conquer the city of Kadesh, that nonetheless he gave the Hittites, as it were, a good thrashing. More recently, most scholars have ended up concluding that basically the battle was something of a draw. I suspect that although one might be able to say that Ramses won a kind of tactical victory, that overall the battle was largely inconclusive as a tactical encounter, but it's also undoubtable that Ramses failed in his larger strategic objective, that he was not able to recapture the city. On the other hand, this was not such a huge setback as is often assumed, because in the coming years, both in the eighth year of his reign and again in the tenth year of his reign, 
And just to say, the Battle of Cadiz happens in the fifth year of his reign. So literally, within the next five years, not once, but twice, he marches his armies back into Syria. And although he doesn't tangle with Kadesh again, he even goes further north and attacks other towns that belong to the Hittite-controlled territory of Syria. And one particular place that he went after was a town called Dapur, which is located somewhat to the north of Kadesh. So here we have the Egyptian-controlled territory in the northern part of what is now Lebanon. Here in the very southern part of Syria, in the Hittite controlled zone, is the city of Kadesh. A little bit further north is this town of Dapur. And so again, it was even closer to the Hittite homeland. And while Ramsey sort of did an end run about Kadesh, he went after this other town called Dapur, and he seems to have conquered it. We have a couple of battle scenes that he had carved on the walls of temples in Thebes, one at the Temple of Luxor and another at the Ramesseum in the West Bank of Luxor. Here we see one of the scenes from Luxor Temple that shows the king fighting on foot as an archer wearing a long coat of armor, a kind of male armor, as he launches arrows at a fortified town of Dapur. Accompanying the scene, there's actually a long hieroglyphic text behind the king which records an apparent speech that he gave to his courtiers that was duly recorded by scribes and then recorded on the walls of Luxor Temple. And it says, and here we can see the, the king himself speaking, as for this manner of my standing and fighting against this Hittite town in which there's a statue of Pharaoh living prosperous and healthy, his majesty, living, prosperous, and healthy, has very truly done it in the presence of his infantry and his chariotry. His majesty took up his body armor to place it on himself only after his majesty had spent two whole hours standing and fighting against the town belonging to the Hittite enemies in the presence of his infantry and his chariotry without having put on his body armor. It's a rather chatty little speech. The two main points the king's trying to uh, show here is that he fought and he was acting bravely and that his own troops, both his foot soldiers and the elite of the Egyptian army, the chariotry, these were like the elite soldiers of the army. They witnessed the king and that in a kind of macho bravery that he refused to put on or forgot to put on his body armor and that he fought there for two whole hours when any lucky Hittite sniper might have taken a shot and ended the glorious reign of Ramses II right then and there. And of course, luckily, they did not. And here we see the king almost recklessly doing this. And of course, it's against the Hittites. This is sort of Ramses kind of little revenge tour to say that you didn't get me at Kadesh and you didn't get me this time either. We have a very different example of the same battle that is shown at the temple of the Ramesseum. This is Ramses' royal cult temple on the west bank of Thebes, actually just across the river from where Luxor Temple is. This time, instead of fighting on foot, we now see Ramses charging the city in his chariot. We often see in Egyptian battle art from the New Kingdom the king assaulting, very often single-handedly, these enemy fortified towns and fighting the armies of these uh, towns out in the field in front of the town that he's trying to capture. Again, chariots were actually lightweight constructions. They weren't like tanks. But this kind of representation should not be taken literally. This is an ideological statement. It is not meant or should not be taken literally. What is interesting here is although it also depicts the same event as we see in the Luxor example, the iconography and the style of the scene is a little bit different than what we saw, not least because now the king is in his chariot. Another interesting little detail, here we see a close-up of the fortified town of Dapur with its defenders on the battlements and some of its soldiers being defeated by the king single-handedly. 
But among the defenders are a group of Egyptian soldiers who are fighting against them. But these aren't just any soldiers. They are actually some of the Pharaoh's own sons. In fact, some of his most well-known sons, including Prince Kamwasa, who was one of the more famous of Ramses II's sons, and even a couple of sons that are shown at one point scaling a siege ladder to try to get into the citadel. And although Ramses was famous for having at least 45 sons, one wonders whether he would have taken so much chance with them, uh, actually putting them into the thick of battle this way. But again, we should not take this kind of scene literally. It is full of ideological content and should be taken with a grain of salt. Shortly after the Battle of Kades in year five, the Hittite king that Ramses had faced off at Kadesh, a king named Muatali, died. And he was succeeded by his young son, who took the throne name Mersili III, but was better known by his personal name, Uri Tesha. Uh, here again, you can see a map of the Hittite Empire with some of the territories that belong to the empire. And of course, this region here being Hittite-controlled Syria, where it was contesting with the Egyptians. In fact, these later wars of Ramses II, including the Battle of Dapur, may have happened once Muatali had died during the early years of Uri Teshup's reign. Unfortunately, the chronology of this is a little bit uncertain. It's hard to pin down. But about this time, when Ramses is basically following up his Battle of Kadesh campaign, Ori Teshup has come to the throne. Now, what then happens is that there are more political problems inside the Hittite Empire, which will change the strategic calculus of the Hittites and lead them eventually to make peace with the Egyptians. Ori Teshup is the younger son of Muatali. And he has a rather rough political time of it. He has an older uncle, the brother of Muatali, who resents the new and young king. And there's bad blood between the new young king, Uri Teshup, and his uh, uncle, uh, who was uh, one of the right-hand men of the late Muatali. The uncle's name uh, was Hatusili. And Hatusili, after several years, of playing second fiddle to what he considered to be his uppity nephew. And of course, his nephew saw Hadosili as an overbearing uncle who didn't know his place. And eventually they came to blows in what amounted to a rather short little civil war, uh, really a kind of coup d'etat. And Hadosili overthrew his nephew and seized the throne. For the rest of his reign, Hadassili, although he seized power, he would face off the fact that he had come to power illegitimately. And one of the ways that he tried to establish his legitimacy as the rightful king of the Hittites was to turn to diplomacy and try to make nice with other great kingdoms, other empires, as equals, as a way of shoring up his legitimacy at home. He tried to make nice with various kingdoms, including the kingdom of Assyria and the kingdom of Babylonia, and he had sort of a mixed record of success. But there was one great kingdom that if he could just make peace with, and if he could gain diplomatic recognition from, would really be a feather in his cap and ensure his status as a true great king and as the legitimate ruler of the Hittite Empire. And of course, that was to make peace with Ramses II, the great king of Egypt. And try and try he did. In fact, it may have been already earlier Hittite kings who don't seem to have wanted Ramses to come knocking at their door in Syria all the time that may have tried before Hadassah to try to make peace with the Egyptians. But Ramses, like his predecessors, would not say yes to peace. And in fact, the later inscription of Ramses II tells us the great chief of Hatti sent messages to appease his majesty year after year, but he never listened to them. 
And so what we see here is Egyptian intransigence, where Ramses, and in fact, earlier Egyptian pharaohs, ever since the beginning of the Egyptian Hittite war, refused to make peace, to, to bury the hatchet with the Hittites, partly because they would have to accept the loss of their former territories in Syria, including Kadesh, but also because the ideology of the pharaohs that demanded the pharaoh was the ruler of the world who conquered all his enemies and forced them to surrender was just re naturally resistant to the idea of peace especially when it was not at the business end of a chariot and a composite bow without total victory. In fact, part of the reason Ramses was so resistant to peace was that he was afraid of losing face. Now, he had fought bravely in Syria with mixed success. He had tried very hard to take Kadesh, but had come up short, yet he had scored a kind of personal victory by repelling the Hittite ambush and being able to claim that he had fought bravely. He had actually conquered the city of Dapur in the eighth year of his reign, but it's very unlikely he was able to hold on to it. And his campaigns in Syria during his eighth and tenth years apparently had temporary successes, but ultimately the war between the Egyptians and the Hittites was a stalemate but it favored the status quo. And ultimately, the Hittites were the ones that controlled Syria. The Hittites could not be dislodged. The Egyptians could not permanently retake these territories. And so we had a, a stalemate. Now, of course, history is replete with frozen conflicts and stalemates that never seem to end. And of course, they only end when one or both sides is willing to back down enough at least to basically give peace a chance. But in order to do that, especially when Ramses would have to come up ultimately empty-handed in terms of territorial gains and admit that he and, and Egypt would never regain Syria, meant that, that he was in danger of losing face. Now, I think one of the geniuses of Ramses as a statesman is that he eventually found a way to actually save face and to, to present a peace deal with the Hittites that finally came in the 21st year of his reign, more than 10 years after his last known military campaign, as a kind of diplomatic victory, which he presented as the Hittites coming begging in submission, as the Egyptian texts say, begging for the breath of life from the pharaoh. And so after waiting the Hittites out, and in particular after this new Hittite king, Hadassili III, was desperate for a peace deal to shore up his own domestic political legitimacy, he was now so desperate for peace, and enough time had passed after Ramses' active military career that now the pharaoh could afford to make a deal, and he could spin the event as a diplomatic triumph in which the foreign enemy had, quote, come begging for the breath of life and had submitted to the pharaoh. Now, of course, this was very much a Egyptian political fiction that matched Egyptian ideology. Of course, the actual diplomatic arrangements were not quite this way. Now, one of the remarkable things about this time period is the fact that we actually have the original documents, at least we have copies of the original treaty documents that the two sides exchanged. During this time period in the late Bronze Age, the international language of diplomacy was the Akkadian language of ancient Babylonia, and the texts were recorded in the cuneiform script of ancient Mesopotamia. Even the Egyptians used this diplomatic language as a way of communicating with other kingdoms. Now, in the archives of the Hittite capital at the site of Hattusha, fragments of a clay tablet were discovered by excavators at the beginning of the 20th century 
that contained the text of the peace treaty document that Ramses sent to the Hittite king Hadassili making peace. The actual document that we have, and here you can see a photograph of it, it is now in the archaeological museum in Turkey, is a kind of file copy because as the tablets and the rec records of the treaty tell us, the original documents were actually inscribed on silver tablets, which had long since disappeared. Now, in Egypt, at the Temple of Karnak in the city of Luxor, the ancient city of Thebes, right next to the Hypostyle Hall, in fact, where I work, is this impressive stele carved on the walls of Karnak Temple, which is a hieroglyphic text that is an Egyptian translation of the treaty text that was sent by the Hittite king Hadassili to Ramses in Egypt. And so one of the a little bit confusing thing is the, the Egyptian version we have is actually written in Babylonian cuneiform and was found in Turkey. The Hittite version is actually recorded in hieroglyphs and is found in Egypt because each side composed its own version and sent it to the other. And what we have are the copies that the Hittites made of the Egyptian document and that the Egyptians meant, uh, made of the Hittite document. The actual documents that each side received from the other were inscribed on silver tablets. Now we know that for some treaties that the Hittites made with lesser kingdoms who were, they were vassals, that they would in sometimes inscribe these treaties on slabs of bronze. But between two great kingdoms, the two most powerful kingdoms of the day, even bronze was not sufficiently a noble enough metal. And therefore, these two great kingdoms traded silver tablets, which had great prestige value. Now, these glittering plaques have long since disappeared. They would have been melted down when the Hittite empire fell. Somebody would have found this silver tablet Ramses had sent and melted it down for scrap. At some point, when the Hittite empire came to an end about 100 or so years after Ramses' time, when there was no Hittite empire to be at peace with, somebody decided, well, we don't need this silver plaque anymore, so let's melt it down and use the silver for something else. So these amazing silver tablets have long since disappeared. Although what I've done here is to create a kind of artist impression of what the silver tablet that Ramses received from the Hittites might have looked like. And we're also helped by the fact that the stela that Ramses set up at Karnak, which gives us a Egyptian translation of the document that he received on the Hittite silver tablet, also includes a brief description of the tablet that he received that tells us, among other things, that it came with two seals, one of the Hittite king Hadassili III himself, along with another seal that was that of the Hittite queen, his chief consort, a queen named Kudukepa, who we'll be hearing a little bit about later. Now, the treaty itself is quite a fascinating document. It, in some ways, it's almost a very modern sounding legal document. It has a number of clauses or sections that spell out very specific stipulations that govern the relations between these two former enemies, transforming them not just from being enemies to being at peace, but actually tr transforming them from bitter enemies into allies. First of all, there had been a previous treaty between the Egyptians and the Hittites that dated back to the mid 18th dynasty, which of course had been void ever since the Amarna period. This treaty said that that old treaty was now reestablished. It also said that there was now a permanent non-aggression pact that spelled out specifically that neither kingdom should ever attack the territory of the other in order to take something uh, from it. And this told Ramses that his dreams of glory of recapturing Kadesh were now over for good. But it wasn't just a matter of non-aggression. They now also swore to be allies that would come to the other's defense if a third country ever attacked them. And it says that if another country attacks 
haughty that Ramses should promise to come with his chariots and his foot soldiers, or if he couldn't come himself, that at the very least he would send his armies to defend Haughty, and that if anybody attacked Egypt, that the Hittites would also send their troops in order to defend Egypt. Another interesting stipulation is a mutual extradition clause that says if any one or any group of men flees from one kingdom and seeks refuge in the other, that the other side must send them back. But it also says that any fugitives who are returned to their home country, that their home country must not inflict any physical punishment, whether it be death or physical mutilation or any other kind of harsh punishment to get them. So in other words, if they actually escape to the other side, they will be sent back, but they will gain a kind of amnesty. Now, all of these clauses between these two great kingdoms are equal. Each side is owed the same due. Each side has the same obligation to the other, except for one clause that is unequal. Of course, Hadassili had come to the throne by overthrowing his nephew. And Ramses, in the wording of the treaty, at least in the, the version that, that Hadassili sent, to Egypt. Ramses is sworn to, to support the heirs of Hadassili against any false rival who would try to overthrow Hadassili or any of Hadassili's descendants, even to the point that if anyone tried to rebel against Hadassili and his heirs, that Ramses would defend Hadassili and his heirs by sending his troops to even fight the Hittites themselves if they rebelled but no such guarantee. And of course, the Egyptians would never have accepted this, obligated the Hittites to defend the, uh, Ramses II or his heirs against any domestic opposition in Egypt. From the Egyptian point of view, the idea that anybody would rebel against Pharaoh or that Pharaoh would rely on foreigners to prop him up on his throne was completely unthinkable. Now, the final clause of the treaty was the list of divine witnesses, because ultimately the treaty itself was a sacred religious oath that was taken and sworn by what is described as being a thousand gods and goddesses of the, of the land of Hatti, the Hittite empire, and a thousand gods and goddesses of the land of Egypt. And these gods and goddesses are not only witnesses, they are also guarantors of the treaty because as it spells out in explicit detail, if the, these two kings or their descendants should ever violate the treaty, then they will bring down the wrath of 2,000 angry Egyptian and Hittite gods who will actually destroy them and their country for violating the treaty. And so this wasn't just a legal document. It was quite literally a, a divine curse. If you messed with this, if you violated the treaty, you would be in deep trouble from 2,000 wrathful deities. In the wake of the treaty, Ramses II and his court continued friendly diplomat or somewhat friendly diplomatic relations with the, the Hittites, their new allies. And among the documents were, that were found in the, uh, the Hittite state archives in the ancient Hittite capital of Hattusa, which is located in east central Turkey, were fragmentary letters, most of them quite fragmentary, a few fairly well preserved, of about 100 or so cuneiform letters that were sent by Ramses and a few members of his court to the Hittite king and queen. And these make for fascinating reading. And in my book, actually, I provide the largest group of these letters that have ever been translated into English, because previously these letters had largely been studied and published by German scholars. And although some of the better preserved ones were published in English, by and large, most of them had not been published in English before. So that is one of the things 
that you will find in the book. And I also, of course, analyze the historical and ideological and diplomatic context of this fascinating group of letters that is secondary only to the famous Amarna letters, the diplomatic letters exchanged between the pharaohs like Akhenaten and Amenhotep III and the other kingdoms of the ancient Near East during the Amarna period. Right after the peace treaty, Ramses permits a number of the more prominent and favored members of the royal family to send congratulatory letters to the Hittite king and queen. And here what we actually see is a pecking order of the, uh, that shows that only the most favored members of the royal family are permitted this one chance, and it, in fact there's only one chance, to be able to communicate with the Hittite king and queen. Among them are the king's eldest son, who here goes by the name Sefir Kopeshef, which is uh, transcribed in Akkadian as Shudachapeshap, and then also Queen Tuya, the widow of the pharaoh Seti I, who is the dowager queen and queen mother, and also, of course, the famous queen Nefertari, the favored great royal wife of Ramses II, whose name is transliterated in Akkadian as Noptera. And these are very formalistic, even rather bland sounding letters of the type, well, isn't this wonderful that we're all at peace and I hope you're doing well. I hope your, your health is good and I'm glad that you sent me a letter saying that you hope my health is well. And here's some nice gifts. And so it's rather anodyne in terms of the content. But what came with these letters was what were known in the documents as greeting gifts. And some of these gifts could be quite extraordinary. So for instance, when Queen Nefertari sent a letter to the Hittite queen Putuhefa, the, the principal wife of Hadassili, she sent a golden necklace that contained over 88 shekels of gold. And by one estimate, that 88 shekels corresponds to roughly 42 ounces of gold, which I just ran the numbers the other day, that is worth at least $78,000 just in terms of its bullion value. Now, this photograph is not actually the necklace that Queen Nefertari sent. This is actually another golden necklace, and I have no idea how much this specific one weighs, but it is an idea, at least, of the kind of thing, you know, this rather queenly gift that Nefertari sent to her Hittite colleague. Other objects that are described in the gift lists are also sometimes uh, replicated by other objects that were found in Egypt. The objects made of gold and silver, again, this one here, this beautiful silver vase with a golden handle shaped like a gazelle, this was not actually one of the diplomatic gifts, but it gives you an idea of the kind of objects that were sent. On the other hand, these two rather unassuming, uh, you know, they're made of gold, they're, they're pieces of gold foil embossed with designs. These, in fact, are actual pieces of some of the gifts that Ramses II sent to the Hittites and that are described in some of these letters. Many of the gifts that he sent to Hadassili and some of the Hittite princes were golden cups, drinking cups. And here we have two gold pieces of foil that are embossed with hieroglyphic text, cuneiform inscriptions, and decorative Egyptian and Near Eastern designs that include this little bit of hieroglyphs that gives the title of the pharaoh as the great ruler of Egypt with Ramses' prenomen, Usermat Re Setepenre. And what's interesting here is that Ramses, of course, in Egypt was known as the dual king, the king of Upper and Lower Egypt. That would, and of course, the, the titles of king and Upper low, and, and Lower Egypt, Nesu Didi, were unique to the Egyptian king. And in fact, the way the Egyptians looked at other rulers, they were not true kings. Only one actual king existed, the pharaoh. Other rulers were mere chiefs, uh, what the Egyptians called Weru. But of course, when they were making nice diplomatically with other great kingdoms that they were 
pretending that they were somehow equal with, because that's the rule of the game, that these kings were equal. The traditional Akkadian term that means great king, when the Egyptians translated the Akkadian term great king into the Egyptian language, when they meant foreign kings, they, they translated as great chief. But when they were translating the title great king referring to Ramses himself, then it became great ruler. And so here in this object that they send to the Hittite king, instead of giving the Egyptian title king of upper and lower Egypt, they give the title great ruler of Egypt. Whereas if the, if the title had been for Hattusili, they would have called him the great chief of Hatti. So they're still trying to show a kind of Egyptian exceptionalism. So, and it's interesting that even the, when they're supposed to be playing by the rules, they can't quite do it. Their, their ideological worldview is so strong that they just can't quite bring themselves to treat these other great kings as equals. Now, about 13 years after the peace treaty, the peace treaty comes in regnal year 21. So in the king's 34th regnal year, um, he further enhances his relationship with the Hittite king and queen by negotiating a diplomatic marriage between Ramses and a Hittite princess. The ancient kingdoms of the Near East, especially the great kingdoms, exchanged foreign princesses as a way of cementing peaceful and friendly relations between the various kingdoms. And uh, as we know from the Amarna letters, the pharaohs seem to have a kind of knack for collecting foreign princesses. But as one letter from a Babylonian king to Pharaoh Amenhotep III tells us, well, the pharaoh was only too happy to marry every foreign princess he could get his hands on, as he tells the Babylonian king who requests the hand of Pharaoh's daughter. Never from the beginning of time has the daughter of the king of Egypt been given to anyone. End of story. And so we don't know, but it seems unlikely that Hadassah even bothered to ever ask for an Egyptian princess. But once it came to Ramses getting a Hittite princess, then let the negotiations begin. Now, we have one rather one-sided view of these events recorded on what is known as the first Hittite marriage decree of Ramses II. Of course, he had two Hittite marriages, but the first one is the best known one. Here you see a stele that's, that's recorded at the great temple of Abu Simbel, and here's a drawing of a scene from the top of the stele that shows the Hittite king bringing his daughter to Ramses. But we also have a kind of behind the scenes look in the, in the form of a number of letters, mostly fragmentary, between Ramses and the Hittite king and queen. And in particular, we see that when it came to negotiating and bartering for the bride, that Hadassili turned the marriage file over to his plucky consort, Queen Pudakepa, who really gave Ramses the hard sell and as we'll see, perhaps was the only person on earth who ever basically told Ramses II, the great pharaoh of Egypt, what she really thought. The negotiations, which of course included a substantial dowry of exotic and rich gifts that the Hittites would send with the Hittite princes, but also with a rich array of gifts that consisted of the bride price, that the Egyptians would send to the Hittites in exchange for the Hittite princess. The delays and back and forth seem to have gone on for months, if not for well over a year. And after a certain amount of extended, dragged out negotiations, both sides started to get a bit testy. And at one point, Ramses, after hearing of the big promises that Hadassili made for this wonderful dowry that he was going to send and do it in a hurry, when nothing was coming, and not least of all the princess, he wrote to Pudukepa, who had sort of taken over the, the negotiations, and said, and of course they would call each other my brother and my sister. That's how they talk to one another. So when he says to Pudukepa, my sister, this is like my, you know, my, my, my political sister, as it were. My sister said that he would send her daughter, 
yet you hold her back unkindly. Why have you not given her to me? Well, by this point, Kudukhepa had exhausted the store of patience that she had with Ramsey's endless demands and complaints. And she writes back a very well-preserved letter. It's actually a draft of the letter that she would have sent to Egypt. They would have sent the letter in Akkadian, but in the home country, the scribes would have drafted the letter to be sent to the other kingdom in their native language and then transcribed it into Akkadian to be sent. And this letter was actually found written in Hittite. And so it was likely the first draft before the, the one that they would have actually sent to Ramses. And that's why it's uh, fortunately so well preserved. And so finally, after getting uh, these whinging complaints from Ramses about the delays, and she makes a few excuses of her own about why it was impossible to, to do anything so as fast as he would want. She finally basically accused him of gold digging at her expense. She says, does my brother really have nothing? Only if the sea and the gods have nothing, does my brother have nothing? That you should wish to enrich yourself from me is neither friendly nor honorable. And so she really basically takes the paint off the walls in basically reprimanding him for being too greedy and eager to get hold of this rich dowry and her daughter. Of course, she also makes a number of excuses, even complaining that, that you know, it was too cold and they couldn't send all the dowry that included a bunch of livestock because they didn't have enough grain to feed all the animals. And if he didn't believe, he could ask the, the Egyptian ambassadors, et cetera, et cetera. And, and then she tries to basically make nice at the end of the letter and try to tell him that, you know, but yes, I know, we're, we're good friends anyways. Now, after a certain amount of time, finally, the bridal party was ready to depart. And it wasn't just uh, the Hittite princess with a few escorts. It was a giant cavalcade that included a military escort of, of Hittite soldiers, probably dozens, if not hit, uh, hundreds of chariots, droves of potentially thousands of animals, goats, sheep, cattle, and horses, all kinds of other um, movable property, even prisoners of war that would be sent as slaves and laborers to Egypt, et cetera, et cetera, that would have marched overland through the mountainous highlands of central and southern Anatolia, down through Syria, Lebanon, and Canaan, and then marching across North Sinai to the Egyptian capital that Ramses built in the northeast delta at Piramises. And this all took place apparently in the winter. And of course, after reading these rather tense behind the scenes negotiations, to understand what happened next, we read the very colorful and not always so believable account in Ramses II's great Hittite marriage stila, which presents a rather different spin on things and presents the entire event as a kind of miraculous wonder that the gods themselves have decreed for Ramses as a kind of personal divine intervention. And in the stila, it says that someone came to the pharaoh and reported, see, the great chief of Hatti has sent his eldest daughter with so many tribute gifts that they cover the road as they come. They have passed many hidden mountains and difficult passes. Send the armies and the officials to meet them. But of course, it was winter time, And it says that the Pharaoh thought about it. Then his majesty thought about these matters, saying to himself, how will they do it, those whom I sent on a mission to Jahi? in these days of rain and snow that happen in winter. Jahi is a very vague term that basically means Canaan and Syria. And it says that he prayed to the storm god Seth, who was also the god of foreign lands. And he says that he gave great offerings to the god Seth, praying, quote, the heavens are in your power. Make no rain, icy wind, or snow until these wonders that you have decreed for me have reached me.
And so then the god Seth himself, the god of foreign lands, the god of storms, basically calms the weather and turns the, the depths of winter into a warm and sunny spring, allowing this wondrous event to transpire and the arrival of the, of the Hittite princess. And then it tells us, then the daughter of the great chief of Hatti came marching to Egypt and was brought into the presence of his majesty. A great many gifts came with her without limit and of every kind. Then his majesty saw that she was beautiful and the foremost among women, and that the officials adored her as a goddess. It was a great and mysterious and a splendid marvel, a miracle that was never before seen or recorded by the ancestors. And here accompanying the scene is the scene that accompanies the text on the stela that shows the Hittite king himself escorting his daughter to Egypt. Of course, he never set foot there. And, and here, of course, Ramses is sitting not in his palace, but in a shrine, hobnobbing it with, at this point, his fellow deities. And another aspect of this text is how it talks about Ramses as himself being a god on earth. And so here we see this idea of the king himself becoming a god, of the gods arranging these miraculous events, and how the Hittite king, supposedly his ally, is in fact a supplicant who comes bearing tribute and bowing down in supplication and even offering his own daughter as tribute to the mighty Pharaoh. This stila is very well preserved at uh, Abu Simbel. There are a few other versions of the stila, and more recently, a fragment of this stila was discovered near the Fayum in northern Egypt that also shows a detail of Hadassili III escorting his daughter, princess, the Hittite princess, to Egypt. Now, once she became one of Ramses II's wives, she was given the elite status among his wives, given the title of the great royal wife. And in fact, as we know from the letters that Pudukhepa wrote to Ramses, she insisted that the, the pharaoh grant her daughter the highest title of an Egyptian queen, in part because she knew very well from international court gossip that foreign princesses that were sent to Egypt had a tendency of disappearing into the residential palaces and being quite forgotten. And in fact, the Babylonian ambassador told her about a Babylonian princess that Ramses had married and that nobody was able to see her or had heard anything uh, about her. And so Hudakeba did not want her daughter to be warehoused. And so she extracted a promise that Ramses would elevate her daughter to the highest level of queenship. And in fact, Ramses did just that. He, he fulfilled his side of the bargain. This is a quartzite sandstone statue of Ramses II at the site of Tanis that originally would have stood in the capital of Paramesis. Unfortunately, rather damaged, it is an image of a queen, and the inscription on it tells us that it is none other than the daughter of the Hittite king and queen, the one that was sent to Egypt. Now, what her Hittite name was, we have no idea. Even in the letters that Pudu Sefa sent and exchanged with Ramses, she is simply referred to as, quote, the daughter. But she received a rather exotic Egyptian name of Mahor Neferure, a name that means something like she who sees Horus, the perfection of the sun god rays. And she also has, of course, the title of the great royal wife and mistress of the two lands. But she is also given the epithet the daughter of the great chief of the Hittites. With this marriage, we come to the end of our talk. The relations between Ramses and the Hittites would continue, and you can read more about it in uh, my book. In fact, he had another marriage with another Hittite princess later on. I also want to call attention to a few websites uh, that have more information about some of my work including the website of the Great Hypostyle Hall Project from the University of Memphis, my Academia EDU page where I have a number of, of my early books and articles, including the SETI, the first publication.
I've been doing Twitter now for a few months and I do a lot of posts. Uh, I had done a bunch about uh, Tutankhamen, Common and now I'm doing a lot about Ramses II with lots of interesting pictures and facts. And then of course, also for more information about the book, you can also see the website of the publisher. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much.